This is going to be a quick explanation of the coagulation cascade. So the first factor that you need to remember is factor 10 or factor X. And this is going to be right in the middle. And the way you're going to remember this is that X marks the spot. Up here to the right, you're going to have number seven or factor seven. And this is because lucky number seven gets to have its own spot all to itself. And then under factor 10, you have all of the factors that make up dollar bills. For example, you're going to have factor five, two, and then one. And then all of the other factors are going to go up here in this upper left corner. So you have 12, 11, nine, and eight. So, so just remember, X marks the spot. Lucky number seven gets its own pathway by itself. And then under uh, factor 10, you just put all the dollar bills down. This right here is called your extrinsic pathway and it's going to affect your PT time. And then this right here is called your intrinsic pathway, and it is going to be affecting your PTT. I'm actually gonna move the two over a little bit. So I'm gonna put two here, and then I'm gonna put one here. So two is actually what we call prothrombin. And what happens is that factor 10 and factor five together will go and convert prothrombin into 2A, which is thrombin. And then the same thing here, you have one, factor one, which is fibrinogen, and that is gonna be converted by thrombin into 1A, which is your fibrin clot. Let's say you have a patient with a prolonged PTT and you find that they have a deficiency in factor nine, that is called hemophilia B, and if you see a prolonged PTT and they have a deficiency in factor eight, that's called hemophilia A. Both of these are X-linked recessive genes, so they tend to happen more frequently in male patients. In terms of what's going to cause an elevated PTT in your patients uh, alone with not so much of an elevation in the PT, uh, that's gonna be sort of what we already went over, uh, which is a factor eight or nine deficiency but also you can have what's called acquired factor inhibitors. So uh, factor inhibitors, which are basically when you create antibodies against factor eight and against factor nine, and that causes uh, the prolongation in your PTT. And the way that you would actually diagnose whether the patient has a factor eight or nine deficiency and could benefit from replacing that uh, versus having a factor inhibitor, in which case you would have to give a different treatment, um, would be with what's called a mixing study. And you can look up what a mixing study uh, actually does, but what they basically do is they take the patient's serum and then they mix it with normal serum, uh, and so if, which has all of the factor eight and nine in it. And so if that corrects the PTT, uh, then the patient has a factor eight or nine deficiency. But if you mix the normal serum into the patient's serum and that does not correct the PTT, that implies that there's some kind of factor inhibitor or antibody that's consuming all the factor eight or nine. And so that's how you're gonna diagnose a factor inhibitor. If you have an elevated PT alone, there's also a few uh, things on the differential for this as well. So the primary one is going to be a vitamin K deficiency. You can also uh, see this in the setting of warfarin use. And then also in just chronic liver disease, uh, you can have a depletion of all your factors and you're especially gonna see an elevation in your PT. That brings up the next point of what factors are made in the liver. And there's an easy way to remember this, and that is DISCO 1972. So that is gonna help you remember protein S, protein C. Remember those are both anticoagulants. So if a patient has uh, deficiencies in protein C and S, then they are actually gonna be prothrombotic and they're gonna be more likely to form clots. And then this is going to be factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. One common question that comes up on uh, the medicine service is, uh, what is a way that you can diagnose uh, DIC versus cirrhosis? Because a lot of patients in uh, DIC are going to consume all of their coagulation factors, and it may look very similar to a patient with cirrhosis, and it can be hard to differentiate, is this a lack of production because the patient has cirrhosis or are they actually consuming everything? And the answer to this is gonna be actually checking the factor eight level. Um, so factor eight is produced in endothelial cells. And so in cirrhosis, your factor eight will actually be normal because it's not made in the liver. 
But in DIC, you're going to have a low factor eight because DIC is just consuming all of your clotting factors all throughout. And so this is actually something we check when we're not sure if a patient is in DIC versus uh, just having coagulation, coagulation issues from their cirrhosis. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about briefly is that there is a difference between what's called primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. So um, for primary hemostasis, this is really a, when you see immediate bleeding after a procedure, for example, like a, a dental procedure, and it just continues to ooze all the time. And that suggests a platelet problem. Whereas secondary hemostasis is uh, when you have delayed bleeding, so several hours after a procedure, for example. And this suggests a problem with the coagulation cascade. So again, just to remember the key points, remember that X marks the spot. Lucky number seven gets its own pathway, which is the extrinsic pathway with an elevation in PT. Uh, all of the common pathway is basically your dollar bills. So 10, 5, 2, and 1. And then all of the other numbers will go into the intrinsic pathway, which is a, an elevation in PTT. You should know the differential for an isolated elevation in PTT and a differential for an isolated elevation in PT. And also you should know which factors are made in the liver and how to differentiate DIC versus cirrhosis. Thanks again for watching. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.